Hello everyone. I'm happy to welcome you to this uh, third lecture in the course on absorbed dose measurements for photon and electron beams. In this lecture, we will look at the absorbed dose measurements for electron beams as, uh, as per the IAEA 398 code of practice. What are needed for absorbed dose measurements of electron beams? It is very similar to photon, but with some differences. One is, of course, you need a water phantom. You need calibrated ionization chambers, but the calibration should be traceable to PSDL, as we said earlier. The preferred chamber is 0.6 cc format chamber, cylindrical one, with a waterproof one or with a waterproof sleeve, as we discussed earlier for photon beams, and also par plain parallel chamber, which is called the pancake chamber or parallel plate chamber. This plain parallel chamber is required for low energy electron beams. And you need electrometers either calibrated with the ion chamber, which is preferred, or should have a calibration factor. And you also need a plastic phantom. And that's the plastic phantom that is here. So you can have plastic phantom, you should have plastic phantom, water phantom, and plain parallel chamber, cylindrical chamber, and electrometers. In addition, you would need barometer, ther thermometer, both are should have been calibrated to measure the pressure, pressure temperature. And you would need a ruler to measure the depth. As I said, I would prefer a stainless steel ruler and IAEA 398 protocol and its worksheets. Let us go on to the formalism. The formalism is very similar to the formalism that we use for photon beams. That is dose to water for a particular energy is equal to meter reading for that energy corrected for the influence quantities. NDW Q0 where Q0 represents the reference energy used at the calibration laboratory and KQQ0 which converts from the reference energy to the energy in question. So MQ is obtained as usual by multiplying the meter reading with pressure temperature correction, polarity correction, recombination correction factor and electrometer calibration factor if the electrometer had been calibrated separately. NDW is the calibration factor provided by the SSDL or PSDL for reference energy of Q0, which is mostly cobalt 60. Let us look at the reference conditions for electron beam measurement. Number one, interesting thing you have to notice, here you see a factor called R50. R50 is the range of 50% depth dose or the depth at which 50% isodose is seen. So this is actually used as the beam quality index, which we will see later. But now if R50 is greater than four gram per centimeter square, it, you have to use water phantom. If R50 is less than four gram per centimeter square, you have the option of using plastic phantom. If R50 is greater than four gram per centimeter square, the chamber you should use should be parallel or could be cylindrical. But if it is less than four gram per centimeter square, which means you work for low energies, then you have to use plain parallel chamber. So now you see the difference. We have plastic phantom, which is allowed for low energies and for high energies, you are allowed cylindrical chamber, but for low energies, you should use plain parallel chamber. The other thing is at what depth you measure the output or do the absorbed dose measurement. In the case of photon beams, we said 10 centimeter for high energies and low energies and cobalt, we said you can go to five centimeter, but here it's slightly different. It changes with energy. And for every energy, you have to determine what should be the reference depth. And this reference depth is determined using R50. So R50 into 0.6 minus 0.1 would give you the reference depth at which you should do the measurement. Coming on to the reference point of the chamber, it is very similar to what we saw in photon beam measurement, which means the inner surface of the window at its center for plane parallel chambers and on the central axis at the center of the concavity volume for cylindrical chambers. But the difference is the position of the reference point of the chamber. It's the same for parallel, plane parallel chambers 
and Z reference, like we did it for photon beams at the depth of 5 centimeter or 10 centimeter. But for cylindrical chambers, it is 0.5 R, where R is the radius of the chamber, deeper than Z reference. So please note that there is a difference with the way you position the chamber for electron beams as compared to photon beams. So SSD should be 100 and the field size is usually 10 by 10 or for the field size for which you measured the output or which, which you used as the reference for output factors. Okay, so please note no cylindrical chamber preferred for less than 10 MeV and for cylindrical chambers, the position should be 0.5 or deeper than the point of interest, Z reference the other way, okay? So please remember these two things. Let us look at what you should use as the water phantom. We said water or plastic, but how do you choose your phantom? For a phantom to be water equivalent for electron dosimetry, it should have either in linear stopping power and the linear scattering power of that of water. It should match that of water. So the linear stopping power, linear scattering power should match that of water. Then you can say this material can be used as a phantom for electron beam. So how do you know this? So if this is approximately achieved, if the phantom material has the same electron density and the same atomic number of water. So if you have a material which has got the same electron density and same atomic number as that of water, then you can use that as the phantom for electron beam measurement. Okay, so absorbed dose measure to water can be, uh, absorbed measurement can also be measured in plastic phantom for, particularly for low energies, we said you can use plastic phantom. You should use, so it is to be used for beam qualities R50 less than four gram per centimeter square or the energy should be less than 10 MeV and chamber must be positioned at the scaled reference depth. See, if you're using plastic phantom, it may be very easy for you to set it up, but there are quite a few corrections you have to do, at least three corrections. Number one correction, you have to correct for scaling, depth scaling. That means you have to correct for the density of the phantom. Okay, so you have to multiply the Z plastic by the density to get the exact, you know, equivalent depth. That, that's a depth scaling. And then when you want to convert it into water equivalent depth, you also have to multiply it by CPL, which is a constant for plastic. And if you multiply that, then the, the ZPL, then the depth becomes equivalent to the depth in water. So this is for the depth corrections. Then you also have to do a correction to the meter reading if you're using plastic phantom. So if M2 is the meter reading for plastic phantom, then you have to multiply that for by HPL to get the MQ at the reference to water. So this is the fluence correction factor. So there are two factors, three factors actually. One is of course the density. The second one is CPL and HPL. The CPL and HPL for each material of the phantom is provided in table 21 of TRS-398. So if you're using PMMA, you're going to use 0.941 as the CPL and 1.009 as the HPL for the correction of the meter reading. So please remember these corrections to be applied if you're using water phantom. I'm sorry if you're using a plastic phantom. Practical considerations, water is recommended as the reference medium, that's fine. But if you're using water phantom or the plastic phantom, you have to ensure that at the point of measurement, the phantom should be larger by five centimeter on all sides, larger than the largest field you will be using. For example, if you'll be using it for 25 by 25, you should have 30 by 30 phantom so that all four sides have five centimeter larger. So for electron energies below 10 MeV, plastic phantom may be used. This we already have seen it. So energy specification for electron beams. This is the interesting thing I talked to you about R50 earlier, right? So normally energy is said as E0, which is called the nominal energy of the beam. When we say a five MeV 
or 6 MeV electron beam, it's not really 6 MeV. You know, it's like a name given. Like, But if you actually measure the energy, it may be slightly different, 6.3 or 6.25, something. So you have to actually measure the nominal energy of that. That is the beam energy at the surface, right? But this normally we don't use it for specifying as the energy index. So the energy index is the beam quality index, otherwise called for electron beam is R50. If you remember for photon beams, we used a parameter called TPR 2010 as the energy index, beam quality index. Here the beam quality index is R50. R50 is the depth at which the electron beam depth dose is 50% of the maximum value. So 50% depth dose point will be R50, right? So next is, how do you get this R50? You have to do a depth dose measurement, but for that there is a reference condition. But the reference conditions are very similar to absorbed dose reference measurement reference conditions, such as R50, if it is greater than four gram, use water, less than four gram per centimeter square, water could be plastic can be used. If the, the chamber type, if it is R50 is greater than four gram per centimeter square, you can use plane parallel or cylindrical. If it is less than four gram per centimeter square, that is lower energies, you should use plane parallel. So again, the reference point in a surface of the window at its center for plane parallel and at the central axis at the central center of the cavi cavity volume for cylindrical chambers. Position of the reference point of the chamber for plane parallel chambers at Z reference for cylindrical chambers. Again, it is 0.5 R where R is the radius of the cylindrical chamber deeper than the Z reference. SSD has to be 100. The only difference is if R50 is less than seven gram per centimeter square, you should use 10 by 10 field size to measure the depth dose. If it is greater than seven gram per centimeter square, you could use 20 by 20. So please note, no cylindrical chamber suggested for low energies, plastic phantom not suggested for high energy electron beams. So the reference depth for determination of absorbed dose, I told you earlier, is actually obtained from the R50. So typically you should measure R50 first, but I'm going to that a little later. But if you know, to need to know at what depth for it, that particular energy you have to measure the output or absorb those measurement, then you should find R50, then multiply by 0.6 and subtract by 0.1 from it, then you get Z reference. So Z reference is the point at which you are going to do the absorb those measurement. And E0 and EZ are determined from R50 and RP. RP is the practical range. We will discuss that later. I said E0 is the mean energy at the surface and EZ is the energy at the depth Z. Electron beams, as it goes through the depth in phantom or tissue, the energy changes. So you need to know the energy at the depth. So EZ is the energy at the de depth and Z0 is the mean energy at the surface. So determination of mean energy at the phantom surface, E0, is very simple. If you know R50, multiply that by C, which is an empirical formula, where C is the 2.33 MeV per centimeter, you get E0. For example, if you're measuring for 10 MeV, if the R50 is, let me say, is a four, then four into 2.33 will give you the nominal energy or mean energy at the surface. So for this valid for electron beams of five to 30 MeV, this equation, very simple. And again, for this equation, you need to determine R50, you got to follow the reference conditions. 100 centimeter SSD and the field size should be 10 by 10 or 20 by 20, depending on the energy. Right, so, let us come to R50 measurement. How do you measure R50? You got to do PDD and take 50% depth of 50% dose, then you get R50. You have to do it in either water or water equivalent phantom. You can use diode or ionization chamber, but if you're using ionization chamber, it provides percentage depth ionization curve, not depth dose curve. But if you use diode, it provides percentage depth dose curve. 
So this is the difference. If you use a diode, you you get percentage depth dose directly. But if you use an ionization chamber, what you get is a percent depth ionization curve. So measurement with the diode represent PDD curve. The reason is the mass collision stopping power ratio silicon to water is essentially constant throughout the depth. Whereas in the case of measurement with the ion chamber, the mass collision stopping power between air to water keeps changing with the depth. So you got to multiply by that to convert it into dose. So if you are using ionization chamber, what you get is the depth ionization curve, which needs to be converted to depth dose curve. And in the case of diode measurement, that is not needed. So please note, no conversion of depth ionization to depth dose for diode because directly you get depth dose. And why? It is because the mass collision stopping power ratio silicon to water is essentially constant over the depth. This is a very important point. So you may be asked in the viva or some exams, please remember that. So now you got, let me say, R50, I mean, you got depth ionization measurement and not depth dose measurement, then you have to multiply by SWR. As I said, this is achieved by multiplying the ionization current or charge at each measured depth Z by stopping power ratio SWR. The other alternative, you have some empirical formula here given in TRS398, where if you use 1.02950 R50, minus 0 0.06, you get R50, actually depth dose point. So for high energies, you use this equation 1.059 and 0 0.37. So this is one shortcut instead of worrying to convert using multiplying by SWR. But I would like to tell you most of the water phantoms uh, that are provided by the vendors, uh, they have a software that converts and depth ionization to depth dose. Okay, so here are some examples of it. This is for a 6 MeV electron beam. You see the red one is the depth dose curve and the blue one is the depth ionization curve. There is a small difference, but it is in millimeter, but for electron beam, millimeter is an important quantity. When you go to 15 MeV, you see the depth ionization is here and the depth dose curve is here, which is the red one. So please remember that you have to take this into account when you use ion chamber for the depth dose measurement. Now, okay, you have got a depth dose curve. Now, how do you get R50? Are you getting R50 only or you get some other quantities? Quite interesting. You get quite a few quantities from your depth dose curve. This is the depth dose curve for a 6 MeV electron beam. What are you getting out of it? Number one, you get R100, otherwise called the range maximum, the point where the dose is maximum in the depth dose curve. Second, you get R85, otherwise called the therapeutic range. This is very important clinically because this is the depth at which you want to treat the tumor, then you use that particular energy. There is a rule of thumb for it. For example, if the depth of uh, treatment is three centimeter, you want to treat a three centimeter depth, you will be using nine MeV. The thumb rule is E by three. E by three will be the therapeutic range, but theoretically it is R85. The idea is the surface dose is about 80 to 85%. And if you go to R85, then the tissue here gets approximately uh, plus, uh, you know, 15 percent, like 85 to 100, plus or minus 7.5, you can say, right? So this is the volume that is being treated. Then the important one for us, that is the beam quality index, R50. So to go to the 50 percent point and note what is R50. This is needed for several reasons. One is you are going to use this to do your absorbers measurement where you are going, you're going to use this as the energy index and to determine E0, you need this, right? And of course, to do EZ also, you need this. The other quantity is RP. 
How do you get RP? You know this uh, deep fall off area in the electron beam. You draw a line on that and see, extrapolate it and see where it comes and meets. And this point is actually the practical range. What is the meaning of practical range? And the, there is no electrons after that, right? That is the point at which the electron beams stop. How do you get the practical range? There is again a rule of thumb. Practical range is E by two. For example, if you have a nine MeV electron beam, the practical range will be 4.5 centimeter. If you have a six MeV electron beam, it will be three centimeter. I have told you two rules, rules of thumb. One is therapeutic range, E by three. The other one is practical range, E by two. One thing I want to emphasize here is, as you see here, the curve doesn't go and end here. I said the electron stop here, but what is, what is this here? You still have some radiation. This is actually called the Bremsstrahlen tail. The electron beams produce Bremsstrahlen X-rays and these X-rays travel a little further and produce, you know, give some uh, radiation dose. So this is actually called the Bremsstrahlen tail. This will be appreciable if you go for high energy beams. For example, let us go and see the 15 MeV electron beam, you see this is quite high. It is not touching the zero here. That means you have some electron uh, Bremsstrahlen here, right? So this is very important. It's not electron beam, a slip of the tongue. This is the Bremsstrahlen tail. Okay, sorry, I jumped. Okay, so now you know the electron beam quality. Apart from quality index R50, you need to know E0, we looked at it. Now the other one is EZ, the energy at the depth. The energy at the depth is given by another formula, E0 into one minus Z by RP, where RP is the practical range. And this is valid for energy less than 10 MeV. So measurement at smaller depth for higher energy, right? Right, so measurement of R50 and RP, we have already seen that in case you do this measurement in the in plastic, again, you have to do the scaling and the conversion. So R50 water will be RPL and CPL. So don't forget the CPL. So if you decide to do R50 in plastic phantom, then you have to apply this correction. So you have to convert the range in water. All right. So we discussed about these two quantities. One is R50, which is very important and RP. I'm just giving you a flow chart how this is useful. So R50 is used to determine Z reference using this formula. Z reference is the point at which you are going to do your depth dose measurement, uh, absorb dose measurement. Please remember Z reference is the point at which you are going to do the output. And it is going to be useful to determine KQ which will be your conversion factor for your calibration factor NDWQ0. So, and then R50 is needed to determine E0 where E0 is equal to R2.33 into R50. RP is useful in determining EZ where EZ is equal to E0 into one minus Z by RP. So this is what we have discussed as far as the energy index and the ranges. Let us go into now, we'll do the absorbed dose measurement, that is the calibration. Let us look at the setup. So this is very important. You have to position the chamber at Z reference, which is calculated like this for each energy. And you have to make sure beyond the field size, there is five centimeter on all field size, preferably 10 centimeters below, though it's not very critical for electron beams. Let us start the measurement. As usual, I do three trials and I try to use an MU which is closer to what we clinically use. Of course, in this case, it's not really so. And we do measurement for three different voltages. One is plus 300, which was used by the SSDL when they calibrated the chamber. And then you do at a reduced voltage, plus 100. This is to determine the recombination correction factor. And also you do at minus 300 volt, this is to get the polarity correction factor. At every point, we do three measurements and take the mean value. Okay, 
So you got to remember before you start your measurement, you check your SSD field size and the depth are correct. Depth is measured at the geometrical center of the chamber. For cylindrical chamber, mode 0.5 are deeper. So please remember that in the case of electron beam, one has to do that. The influence, influence quantities corrections is very similar to photon waves. So you have to do a pressure temperature correction, KTP. Here in this case, the temperature is 19.4 and the pressure is 100.7. So you do a pressure temperature correction factor and it comes to 1.0038. Again, I want to repeat, measure the temperature in the phantom and not do not take the room temperature, right? So the temperature measurement should be in phantom. The next one is the polarity effect correction, KPO, for which you did two measurements, one with a positive potential of 300 volts and the other one with a negative potential of 300 volts. So this is for positive potential, this is for negative potential. So you apply that in this equation, you get KPO 0.992, okay? Then the last thing is ion recombination correction factor. We did measurement at two different voltages. One is 300 volts and another reduced voltage of 100 volts. And for 300 volts, we got 1.99, for 100, we point 1.976. But here you use this equation, which is for the pulse beam, where the A0, A1, A2 are provided in the TRS3 and A9. So when I apply that, I get a value of 1.003. So please remember here V1 by V2 should be equal to or greater than three. But there have been situations where we had to use two because that particular electrometer had only two, 300 and 150. But generally speaking, it is advisable to use V1 by V2 equivalent to or greater than three. Now, the, you know R15 and from this you should be able to get KQ for your ion chamber. For example, if you are using Capintech PS003 and your R50 is 4.5, then your KQ is 0.916. So you need to determine this to apply that correction. Uh, let us now start with the electron beam worksheet. We fill up all the information about the institute, the equipment that you use, the nominal energy, the R50 measured and the reference phantom. And in case you used plastic, then the beam quality has to be converted. And the reference depth, which is calculated using R50. So all these will have to be fed in. And the next important thing is about the ion chamber that uh, details. This is important because if you enter this, you will use the correct Calibration factor and the unit. Please note you have to use the correct unit, gray per nanocoulomb, because normally our electrometers are reading or in nanocoulomb, so I normally convert it and R50 values. And you need to note the reference condition for pressure and temperature from your calibration certificate. Also, you have to note what was the voltage given used during calibration and the polarity used and you need to use the same thing. It's a good idea to note the date of calibration because normally we say if it is more than two to three years, you get it recalibrated. Okay, and again, you mentioned what phantom you used, sorry, and the meter reading, per, that is the nanocoulomb, corrected meter reading for 100 mu, then what is the nanocoulomb per mu? So you divide by 100, you get this. So you got everything now. Now you have to apply all the influence quantities correction. So you know the pressure temperature, we calculated this to be 1.0038. Then for the polarity correction, we did measurement at two voltages, plus 300 and minus 300. And we have the value and calculated this to be 0.992. And for recombination correction, we did uh, two different voltages, plus 300 and reduced voltage of plus 100. And these are the two values, the M1 and M2. And we calculated this to be 1.003 using this relationship, which is for the pulse beam.
and you apply all these correction pressure temperature polarity and the recombination correction you get 0.0198 nano coulomb per mu then you have to multiply by kq and the ndw that you had here so ndw into kq so you got to multiply this and ndw see this is the equation mq is equal to ndw and kq you get the value in cgy per mu right dose absorbed dose measured at reference depth not at d max so to convert this absorbed dose measured at reference depth you need to divide it by the percentage depth dose for that particular one so you got to go to a pdd graph and look at what is the percentage at that particular reference depth divide by that to get the dose at d max and if you want to now tune it to one, that's you are welcome to do it. So this is how you do the absorbed dose measurement for electron beams. And you need to repeat this for every energy that you have on your linear accelerator. And please remember the conditions, reference conditions. If it is a low energy, what chamber to be used, what phantom to be used, all those you have to follow. Thank you very much for listening. There are some MCQs. Please do them and make sure that you are thorough with this.